Hello, and welcome to the Hand Plane Challenge, British edition. I'm Mark, your host and referee slash umpire. Why am I the referee slash umpire? Some of the planes we evaluate here deserve to have strikes called on them for lousy design, lousy engineering, or lousy usability, or a combination of all three. If you're new to the video series and are wondering what's going on, I've made a introduction video. I'll put a reference to it down below. I heartily encourage you to watch that before watching this video. Okay, time for something different. The Hand Plane Challenge British Edition. Today we'll be starting a three-part series on British planes. Why is it three parts? Well, I only own three planes, three British planes, so that made it pretty easy. Uh, we're going to look at three British planes. The first one is going to be a Scottish infill smoother. The second is going to be a Preston number no. nine. And the third is going to be a Markles X4. Now, unlike our previous videos, we're going to be comparing all three of these as one challenge, but we're going to do them in separate videos. However, we'll still have a conclusion at the end of the three part series. Okay, then. Let's, uh, let's look at the first one, the Scottish Infill Smoother. Okay, here we have our Scottish Infill Smoother. First of all, what is an infill plane? Well, it's pretty simple. Um, as you can see, there's a cast iron body here. And the insides of the cast iron body are filled in with wood, hence the name, of course, infill plane. Um, and it's not much more complicated than that. So, I do not know very much about this plane. As far as I can tell, it has no manufacturer's mark. Underneath the cutter, stamped on the top of the wood surface of the, what would be the frog, is H. Johnston. On, but it, on both sides, I have not been able to find a reference to an H. Johnston manufacturer, so I'm guessing that it's pretty likely that that's an owner's mark. The iron, even though it's horribly beat up on the top, I was able to make out that that is a W. Marples and Son iron. Um, I'm not actually sure that Marples made very many infill planes. Perhaps someone out there can can help it illuminate that. Um, and so, basically, I don't know. The person I bought it from claimed, I think, that it was a Slater plane, but I've been unable to confirm that. And in fact, on most of the Slater planes that I see, they do not have this style of sidewall, so I'm pretty sure that that's uh, inaccurate. Infill planes pretty much had their heyday in the 19th and early 20th century. Some um, infill planes were manufactured and some were made by craftsmen who purchased the cast iron body and then made the rest of the plane themselves. I, I have a strong suspicion that that's what we have here. Infill planes don't lend themselves to mass production. To fit this wooden interior to the cast iron body requires a lot of handwork. Thus, 
they tend to be fairly expensive to produce. The commercial viability of infill, infill planes began to go down when, Stanley, when the cheaper Stanley planes began to flood the marketplace. The infill plane industry never really adapted to this trend and the major companies gradually disappeared. However, their prized possessions, vintage infill, infill planes tend to command high prices relative to metal planes. Alrighty then, so that's uh, lacking specific information about the manufacturer. That's about all I'm going to say about the background of this plane. Let's take it apart. Unscrew. Remove. And voila, we're done. <laughs> That's about the easiest disassembly that we've ever done in this video series. Because infill planes are at heart relatively uh, relatively simple machines. So surface that the plane rests on, you can see that the cast iron body, there's a fairly large metal uh, surface down here for the, for the uh, cutter to rest on. There's a brass hole down here. We're not going. We are not going to take that off. It's pinned in there, and I guess technically you could unscrew here and try to take the wood out, but we're obviously not going to do that here. That would be a lot more work, and it wouldn't really gain us very much in understanding this plane. As I said, you can't see it, but there's the H. Johnstone stamped in there. There's a little bit of damage here to the horn of the tote. It's a smooth metal bottom. And, um, and uh, the tote, we've run into this before, but the Scots apparently had smaller hands than, than me at least. You can't actually get all of your fingers in here so you're either going to have to do the three finger grip or something else. I personally like being able to get all my fingers in there but it's not going to be possible with this one. Okay, um, fairly thick cutter. Um, that's a nice feature. And so there you have it. Uh, Let's just take a moment and compare this to, I know it's not going to be the part of this uh, series, but let's just compare and contrast a little bit to a wooden smoothing plane. Here's one. So what do you get when you, get, when you have an infill plane rather than a wooden smoother? Okay, you get a different kind of hold down, this brass screw operated hold down rather than the wedge. You obviously get the metal body, so there's a you know distinctly better feature than than a woody. As the wooden bottom wears, you have to flatten it and eventually the uh, mouth opening gets so big that you have to either resole it or do something else to fix that. Um, obviously this infill plane has a tote and this wooden plane does not. However there are some wooden smoothing planes that are toted so that's not really a difference between these two. Uh, a lot of infill planes, I don't remember about this one, um, So let's just take a look. Also a nice thick iron. This one actually is made by, uh, I can't quite make that out, but uh, also an English style plain iron. I need to clean that up a little bit obviously. Um, and so Woody versus infill.
Another major difference between these two planes is weight. The Scottish infill plane is a solid 5.0 pounds. The wooden smoother, 2.0 pounds. So two and a half times heavier for the infill plane versus the woody. Now, on the one hand, that probably makes it a little bit more fatiguing to use this infill plane all day. But I think a lot of people feel that that is offset by the fact that the extra weight makes it press down against the wood more and thus is easier to uh, maintain contact of the cutter with the wood and get good shavings. One final comment on the comparison of the wooden smoothing plane to the infill plane. With a wooden plane, you adjust the depth of the cutter by either tapping the back or tapping the blade and the wedge like that. And some people scoff at this notion, but that actually is a perfectly good, nicely sensitive way to set the plane, the, the depth of the cutter on a wooden plane. And it is actually ex quite usable. People generally don't appreciate that until they actually start using wooden planes. In contrast, with the Scottish infill smoother, you are not going to be hammering the back of this thing anywhere. So when you need to set the depth of adjustment, you're basically you know, going to just move it up and down. You can see that this one has mushroomed the top. Someone in the past has been hammering on it too much, so that's uh, not good. But apparently, as far as I can tell, the only way to do this is to loosen it, move it up and down, and if you need to make fine adjustments, you indeed, I see no what, nothing to do except to set it to light and then tap it down until it gets to the right point. And if you go too far, there's no hammer in the back to loosen it. You're just going to have to back up and start over again. If someone out there knows a better procedure or if something I'm describing is inaccurate, by all means, please leave a comment below so that we can uh, all figure out how to do this better. Okay, so, so in that comparison, frankly, depth adjustment, I like the wooden smoother better. All right, what else can we say about the Scott's product here? That's, uh, I think that's about it. Let's, uh, let's see if it'll take shaving. Okay, so now we're going to take a shaving, and in this test, I'm, I have not set this iron ahead of time, so we're going to see just how much it's going to take to get this to take a nice shaving. So laterally, we're a little off to the left. Okay. Not too bad. That's a little, it, it was a lot harder before. Um, trust me. Still a little, a little off to the left. A little thick. I was using this plane in a project, and it, once you get it set, it worked magnificently. So I'm going to try to back it off just a smidge. May have to go back. Yeah. See, there you have it. It's there's no reverse on this thing. Let's 
still a little thick. Back it off. Trying to be gentle. Yeah, not too bad, but still needs a little That's getting there. It's long. It's not quite the whole width What I'd like to do is Let's see if we there is a, a theory out there, I think, that if you tighten this thing, it makes a microscopic change. Or if you tighten or loosen it, you can make a microscopic change in the depth of cut without having to manually do anything. That was tightening it. That made it thicker. Let's see what happens if we loosen it. Yeah. Okay. So maybe that's working as advertised. Tighten a little more. Yeah, okay. Mm. Okay, there you have it. I finally had to go off camera and work on this thing. I honed the blade a little bit, you know, because I was using this quite a bit from the last sharpening, so maybe the blade got a little dull. Uh, and then I rejointed the board to make sure it was at least somewhat flat. I'm not even sure it's quite right yet. And then I've adjusted this plane now. It's maybe still not perfect, but it's doing better than it was. Let's take a shaving. Trying to go for the whole length of the board. Decently thin, whole length of the board relatively wide I'm kind of back to where where it was like I say I have to admit I was doing face planing not edge planing but edge joining but face planing the faces of boards with it on the project and it was doing very nicely so There you have it. I hate to say it, but a little bit finicky to adjust. And it took me some some doing. Once I get it adjusted, it it's pretty nice to use. I I I've I've enjoyed using it, but uh, but it's finicky. So we're not going to go in depth into the conclusion. Stay tuned when we get to the end of the three part series. We'll. Uh, we'll, we'll make a conclusion for all three of them together. If you like this channel, please subscribe or at the very least leave comments below because I'd really like to hear from you and figure out how to make this video series better. Thank you and uh, we'll see you on the next one which will be about the Preston number nine.